If you would uh, stand with me as we read the word. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Let's pray. Father, as we consider this passage, just a few verses, the meaning in here is so deep, so profound, so impacting to us here in this age. And so, Lord, we need your spirit to work in us, to to reveal your truth, your message to us. We need your spirit, Lord, to soften our hearts, that we would be obedient and pliable to your will. So, Lord, this is your time. Use it for your glory in the lives of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Some of you can remember back to 1997. Some of you can't for one reason or the other. Some of you have socks in your drawer that are older than that. That's the way it is. It seems like these times go by really quickly. Well, 1997 is when really social media started. It wasn't that long ago, really. Just over 20 some odd years, do the math, Jay. 27 years. Yeah, not that long. Social media started, and then think of the impact it has on us today. In social media, it is really important that people look at one another, right? They say, follow me. And just like we see this tab here, follow me. There we go. We want to be followed. Why is it people want to be followed? Why is it people have this sense and this need, this urgency to look at me, look what I'm doing? Well, we as human beings kind of need that affirmation in one way or the other, don't we? Follow me. Well, who are the ones who are most followed? Who are the ones? I I did a search, and you're going to see it on the screen here. Who's the most followed on social media? Cristiano Ronaldo. He has 905 million followers. Selena Gomez, Justin Bieber, Taylor Swift, Ariana Grande, 690 million, and then counting down. That's a lot of people following somebody. Cristiano uh, Ronaldo, by the way, is a soccer player in, in Europe. Okay, yeah, in case you were wondering. The rest of them are singers, and all of these people are like 40 and under. So it's a big thing among the younger generation to be followed. Hmm. What does following mean in social media? It really means you're just a voyeur, right? You're just watching somebody else's life and opinions and things like that. There's really no commitment to that person, no change of lifestyle, no, no, um, no commitment to do what they say to do or encourage you to do. It's just you're watching them. And sometimes it impacts us. Sometimes we learn a few things. Sometimes we're just appalled. That's following. In today's passage, there's something quite different. Jesus says to these soon-to-be disciples, follow me. Now, that doesn't mean anything according to the follow me with social media. There's no commitment in social media, but Jesus was calling the disciples to a full Lifelong commitment 
to change their lives, to radically change each one of their lives. In today's count, there's 2.6 billion plus Christians in the world. Those who call themselves Christian, those who say they're Christian, they're part of a church or whatever, 2.6 billion. The question that comes to my mind, are they followers of Christ? Are they followers like Jesus was trying to come to with these, these uh, men in the Sea of Galilee, the fishermen, calling them to follow him? Are we followers of Christ by what Christ means in this follow me statement? Hmm. The point we're going to make today, and the main point is that Jesus calls disciples and disciples answer his call. It seems rather simplistic, but it is quite profound that Jesus calls people to be disciples. Now, what is a disciple but a learner? It is a person who is dedicated to learning the ways of the teacher. Think of grasshopper and Kwai Chain Cane. That's the way back machine, kung fu. It's it's the sensei and the learner, the pupil, the one who's going to learn the techniques, the ways, the philosophy, and live it out. That's essentially what a disciple is. And Jesus calls disciples, and disciples answer the call. I hope you're thinking about this because when we say disciples answer the call, do we, you and me, those of us in this room, are we truly answering the call of Jesus when he says, follow me? Hmm. This is where we're going to get to thinking about some of this, this stuff. Um, let's, let's look at the, the background here. Where is Jesus at this point? In looking at the, the uh, book of Mark, he was down in southern Israel at the time, near the Jordan River, near where the Dead Sea is. But now he's moved his way up to the Sea of Galilee, that region around this very large lake. Uh, Josephus tells us that this is an area 60 by 30 miles across, and it had about 204 villages that were 15,000 people, more or less. So you can see that this region had a lot of people, a, a high population there. And it is, of course, dominated by the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is a lake, and you can see it's kind of a kidney shape, a heart shape uh, kind of lake, 13 miles by, uh, by, what was it, eight miles wide. It's 690 feet below sea level. So that's quite a ways. It's about 110 miles away from the Mediterranean shore. And so then it goes over some mountain ranges and down into this, into this deep uh, uh, part of the earth. And then it goes down farther as you go down the Jordan River to the, to the lowest point on earth, which is where the Dead Sea is. So this lake... Freshwater lake is fed by the, the waters of the mountains around it. And, and in this lake, there is an abundant amount of fish. The fish uh, that, that uh, is most popular there is the mango tilapia. It has nothing to do with fruit. <clears throat> it is, uh, it's also known as St. Peter's fish. Okay, And some of you that have been to Israel have eaten and partaken of this about typically uh, 16 inches long and three and a half pounds. So it's a larger size fish and good eating. And so the area around there kind of built itself around uh, the fishing industry. So there were a lot of fishermen that would go out into these smaller boats uh, that had a sail on it. And they would go out and they would use their nets. And there were different kinds of nets. There was a, like a, a, a round kind of net that they would throw into the water with ropes and haul it back. It had... Um, it had some floats kind of on one side and some weights on the other, so it would turn and, and uh, catch the fish. They also had a conical kind of uh, uh, net that would do the same thing. And they would go out in the boats, 
and then cast their nets out and then bring it back in, haul it into the boat, and then do it again. Sometimes they would just do this from the shore. Okay, so, so we see here with uh, the, uh, the men here who are um, fishing that this is their lifestyle. Um, they were along the Sea of Galilee. And so who do we find there but Sandru, Sandru and, and Iman? <laughs> Just seeing if you're following me. Um, Simon and Andrew. And, uh, and so there's also John and James and their father, Zebedee, that are mentioned here. So uh, interestingly enough, if you take all four of the Gospels and you start looking at this account... Jesus had actually met Andrew in the book of John. In chapter 1, verse 35, they had met. Andrew was a follower of John the Baptist that we talked about last week. And so, so he already had the sensitivity to spiritual things. He was listening to John. John who would say, uh, after me comes one whose, whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Uh, he would listen to John saying, there, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world as he saw Jesus walking by. Andrew was the one who said, where are you staying to Jesus? And Jesus said some very profound words, come and see. Come and see. The, the words of the master, uh, an invitation. Come and check me out. See where I'm staying the night. So Andrew knew Jesus by this point. But we also find that Andrew did something that is very much an example to all of us. He went first and found his brother. He went to his brother, Peter. This is the one. This is the Messiah. So Peter was already acclimated to this idea of Messiah was here. He was making his impact. Now, you read into one of the other Gospels in Luke chapter 5. We find that as Jesus comes to the Sea of Galilee, is walking alongside, he's teaching people. Remember, looking at verse 15, Jesus is, is preaching in the Galilee. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. He's preaching this message in the Galilee region. The crowds are growing. And in chapter 5 of Luke, as you read there, you'll see that the crowds were pressing. And Jesus was pressed up against the sea, and he calls to Peter, who's in his boat, and says, hey, come here, take me out a little way. And so he began to preach to the masses from this little boat. And then as you read, after the meeting was over, Jesus says, Peter, pull out here a little further. Cast your net out. Oh, we were up all night doing this. It's not going to work. Okay, I'll do it. He casts his net out and catches a boatload of fish, hauls it in, and he is amazed at what's going on, and he bows down to Jesus and says, go away from me, for I am a sinner. I'm not worthy to have you around me. And we come to this, where Andrew and Peter are receiving the call from the Lord you see, the book of Mark is not going to have all the details. Remember we said last week that this is written to the Romans, and it is, it is just uh, rapid fire. He's just showing little scenarios. Uh, I called them shorts, video shorts, where you just have 30 seconds of, you know, of a scene, and then it moves on to the next one. And so as you, as you uh, put the Gospels together and you start understanding the whole pattern of what's going on, you get those details, and Jesus turns to... Andrew and Peter, and says, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. That's verse 17. That's what I really want to focus in on, is that statement, particularly follow me, and how that applies to us, how it applied to them. 
the call. I call this sermon the call of Jesus. Why? Because that's exactly what it is. The call. The call of Jesus. The call is first personal. It's very personal. You look at the the wording here. It's directed toward individuals. An individual believer. Andrew and Peter. They believed. They saw Jesus. They knew who he was. And there must have been some kind of sensitivity toward Jesus. They were drawn to him, but where were they? They were not following him on his heels at that point. They went back to their trade, fishing. And Jesus sees them there and says, follow me. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at the word follow me, there is not really a subject in that command. And me being a fourth grade teacher... This is a, I just had to identify the kind of sentence. It's an imperative sentence. It's a command. And with a command, you have an implied subject. You follow me. And so he's directing this toward Andrew and Peter. You follow me. That's personal. Now, Jesus called each one of his 12 disciples. Do you realize there were many, many, many more people following Jesus The the multitudes were drawn to him. Then there were those who were somewhat committed to him. And then there were the 12 that Jesus picked out that he would invest himself in. Okay, here's the beginning of it. Andrew and Peter. The call is personal. It's directed to an individual believer. But now we see it is directed to Jesus. Or it is directed to toward Jesus or from Jesus. That's the term I want. It's from Jesus. It comes from Jesus. He says, I want you to follow me. I want you to follow me. The faith in Jesus, our faith in Jesus, is not faith in a system. It is not faith in a religion. It is faith in in a distinct person. And that person is in Jesus Christ who came, lived, like we're seeing here in the book of Mark, taught, served, gave his life a ransom for all humanity so that we might have a relationship with God that our sin would be eradicated, taken out of the way. It is a learning and growing process. I skipped ahead. The call is impacting. It is impacting. The impacting, it is a directional change. It's a directional change. Uh, When he says, follow me, that implies that, that somebody is going a certain direction And now they're supposed to follow whoever's calling, correct? So it is a directional change in life. He's calling Andrew and Peter to do something radically different. And we all have our ideas about our life, our lifestyle, what we should be doing. That's just the way it is. We think we should have a certain amount of success by a certain time in life. We think we should have this kind of job. We think we should have this kind of influence. We should have this kind of a house and a place to stay. We should have this kind of uh, retirement account. And we have these concepts of what life is to be about. Jesus is saying, follow me. Follow. Turn around, change your direction, and follow me. Do you realize what's at stake? Everything, everything in your life is turned around. Everything in these disciples' lives were going to be turned around. They could have easily kept going in their careers, in their businesses, and died years later. But God was calling them to something different. And that's exactly the way it is for you and me. 
God is calling us to be his disciples, to follow him, to lay everything before him and put it at his desires, his will, and let us change and follow him. Our course needs to follow Christ. And it is a learning and growing process. Look at the the wording there uh, in verse 17. It says, I will make you become. Who does it? Jesus. It is not anybody else. We may have people that influence our life and people that teach us things. But it is ultimately Jesus who changes us who gives us that will to change. I will make you. It is him making us. As we allow him, that's responsibility, that control. He will do something radically different in our lives. The, the word there um, for follow is to accept and follow the leadership of, the command, the guidance, an, uh, the guidance of another. And it usually involves literally walking and following as well. So it is a lowering of yourself in the ranking of life and allowing someone else to teach you. That kind of goes against the grain, doesn't it? Just a little bit. I am the master of my own fate. That's what we want to believe. I control. I make the decisions. I fought hard to be in this place to rule my life. It really doesn't get us very far. Because we realize, (laughs) and those of us that are getting older, you realize you don't make a lot of your own decisions, do you? Your body tends to do some of that for you. And you realize, I am not the hero I thought I was back in my 20s. I can't do the things I used to do. I'm hurting. I'm old. Somebody, somebody else, something else is starting to control and influence us. And we've got to just realize that that's the way life is. I will make you become. Jesus, as we listen to his call to follow him, he will change, shape our values He will change our perspective in life. Our motivations will all change. They will change from a very temporal, present here now kind of uh, mentality to an eternal perspective. Peter and Andrew, James and John, fishing in the lake, They were just interested in casting their nets out, getting the fish, taking them to market, selling them, and getting some money so they could buy some other things. It was right here and now. And then they had to do it again tomorrow. There were no refrigerators, no freezers. They had to keep this process going. It was hand-to-mouth living. And we do the same thing in our, our experience We do a lot of hand-to-mouth living, just I'm concerned for today. And then if we have a little bit of extra resources, we can put them away, and those become something that we draw on in the future, but we can't count on them being there when we need them. You know, Jesus calls them saying, follow me, follow me. Did they have what it took to actually follow Jesus? Did Jesus share with Andrew and Peter all of what was going to happen in their lives? No, not at all. Can you imagine if he did? Peter, 
you're going to go through a lot of frustrating times. There's going to be people coming at you. You eventually are going to, oh, he did actually reveal some of that later on to Peter of how he was going to die. Fortunately, he didn't. The thing is, Jesus does not call the gifted. Those people with all of the talent, skills, abilities, knowing everything about everything, he gifts the called. He will provide those who are responsive to his call. And the call may seem very far out from what we can do in our lives. Jesus will gift you, just like he gifted Andrew, Peter, James, and John, for their ministries. The call has an immediate effect. What do they do? Look at verse 18. It says, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Down in verse 20 to James and John, immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat. I bet he had a few words to say. I, I just, I'm just guessing that. Um, he left Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Yeah, you realize James, John, and Zebedee, they probably were fairly wealthy. If they had hired servants there, they were probably pretty well off. And there's some indications also, just because uh, as you read the, the Gospels, and when Jesus is being tried and, he, and, and John is able to go in the house of the high priest, he had connections So you can see that they probably were pretty wealthy at this point. But notice what they say. They they left their nets. They left their father. They left the business. They left all of their livelihood. They left their relationships. That's what follow me means. That the call of Jesus is so far superior to any other call on your life. That's a disciple that takes up that call and follows Jesus. How many billion people call themselves Christian? What did I say? 2.8 billion, 2.6 billion How many of those take up that kind of call? In this room, my prayer is 100% of you will take up that call because that is the only call that matters eternally but also for you personally because as you follow that call, it will take you to places and, and uh, be involved in, in ministry, life, that you never deemed possible. I'm looking around here, the room here, and I'm seeing what God's call has done in particular lives, taking them across the world to minister, taking them out of the state or, or out of the region in which they live to minister for years and years and years. And is it all just ministry, like preaching? I got to be a preacher or a missionary. God might call me to China. God might call me to the deepest, darkest, whatever. Uh, are we worried about that? To be honest, we come on, be honest. Yeah, a little bit, maybe. I mean... That's kind of uncomfortable. Allow Jesus' voice to resonate in your ears. Follow me. Follow me. What does that mean? Lord, what are you calling me to and toward? They left their nets and they followed Jesus. And the word follow here is different from when Jesus says, follow me. It's a different word. It means to walk the same road. It means to come and imitate my example. That's that's what they're talking about. It's to imitate the thoughts and beliefs and actions and lifestyle of another. Uh, Chuck Swindoll brings out the the idea that when you're talking about a a child of of, uh, a father, um, you would say he's following in the footsteps of his father. That's what happened here. They're following after Jesus. And this is really a watershed moment in the lives of the disciples. 
a watershed moment. You take a rain drop that falls along the continental divide, the, the spine of the Rocky Mountains in, in the center of our country, and a raindrop that falls on the east side of the peak will eventually flow to the Atlantic Ocean. A raindrop that falls on the west side will eventually get to the Pacific Ocean. That's a watershed moment. And this is what's happening with these disciples-to-be. That they're making a decision that will impact, influence the rest of their lives. And that is where all of us have to go to at one point or the other. Some of us, long ago, we did, made that decision. Some of us have yet to make that decision. Some of us have made that decision, but have kind of forgotten about it. We've gotten comfortable with where we're at. The call of Jesus, the call is the third major point here, influencing. It's influencing. I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men. Using, actually it was a pretty common term in that day to, to say you're a fisher of, of men. It, it wasn't, wasn't uh, an uncommon term. Jesus uses it and flips it because he's applying it to fishermen, which makes total sense. But remember, it's follow me. It's change the direction of your life. I'm going to do something very different from you uh, than what you've, you've been doing. You're going to focus your life not on pleasure, not on your own self-interest, but on God's interest. You know, this kind of interesting. You start thinking about the analogy here. I will make you fishers of men. Okay, they're casting their nets out. They're reeling in the fish. And then what's happening to the fish? They're all going to die. They're all going to get cut up and et. You know, I, the analogy kind of falls apart. You don't want to take it too far. The idea is I, I'm gonna, you're going you're gonna to be someone who, who reels in this great catch for the glory of God so that people will find salvation, that they will be whole, and, and they will be useful to the living God. Follow me and you will be fishers of men. It spreads and duplicates itself. You realize that in saying this one little phrase, Jesus is talking about a duplication process. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. There's three people involved right there. There's Jesus, the disciples, and those who they were going to catch and influence. It's duplicating. It's, it's spreading. A.W. Tozer said this, only a disciple can make a disciple. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you into something that is attracting others for a purpose, for a higher purpose. Hopefully you still have your Bibles open to Mark. Flip back a page to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. These are the words of Jesus just before he ascends to heaven. He's speaking to his disciples and says this. We're going to pick up with verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." We know this as the Great Commission. We've heard this. If you've been in church, you've heard it all your lives. You've gone to missions conferences, and it's posted up behind the speakers. Go, therefore, into all the world. <sighs> Beautiful statement. Go, 
therefore, having gone is what it means, having gone into the world, having gone and spread into the world, do what? What are they supposed to do? Make disciples. Now, again, this is that spreading thing. You have Jesus telling his disciples to go and make disciples. It is spreading. It is spreading. Um, Go and make disciples of all the nations. So it is going beyond the borders of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And what are they supposed to do? Baptize them. That's an event. But then the ongoing part is teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Teaching them to observe. Do you understand? This is an ongoing process of teaching and of receiving, learning. And what are they learning? They're learning to do all that Jesus commanded the disciples to do. It's plugging in the teachings of Jesus into your own life. But you see, it is a process. Um, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Paul the Apostle is talking to Timothy, his protege, and he says this, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's not just three generations, that's four. You have four generations. Teach people who will teach people who will teach people. Keep it going on. I don't know if you guys remember back in the 1970s, the, uh, the, the shampoo commercial, I think it had Heather Locklear in it, and, and where she, she told two friends, and she told two friends, and, she told, and, the, and the picture multiplies. That's it. It's growth exponentially. That's what is designed to happen. And we are to be part of that process. Paul is talking to his son in the faith. It also says this about women. It says women, in Titus chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, that older women are to teach what is good and so train the younger women. We're to be involved. It is not something where you come and just hear a speaker and speak about the things of Jesus and go on. You get the training, you get the hearing, you let it sink into your hearts and lives, and you start the duplication process. The elders of the church, Ephesians chapter 4, are to equip you to do the work of the ministry. You're to do the work of the ministry. Oh, Jim, man, I thought that's what we paid you for. (laughs) Yeah, I get to do the equipping, okay? I get to be involved in that process. I get my time freed up so that I can do that. But the pastors and teachers and uh, the leadership of the church is to equip you to do the work of the ministry. Now that I've gone through all this, guess what? You need to know that the call, the call of Jesus, it guides Calvary Crossroads. It guides Calvary Crossroads. Star Trek has a prime directive. Do you remember what the prime directive is for Star Trek and and the fleet as it goes out into the great unknown? Starfleet General Order Number 1 is the guiding principle that prohibits its members from interfering with the natural development of alien civilizations. Prime directive number one. (laughs) We have a prime directive, and it is totally to influence and interfere with the alien civilization. I just thought that might apply. And this is what it is. It is that discipleship process. Um, We have a credo. Um, Do you have your bulletin with you? Look on the front cover. Right underneath Calvary Crossroads. What does it say? uh, You're mumbling well. To make, make, who... Yes, 
We're to make disciples who love God and people. That's our credo. That's the guiding principle. We get it right here from Matthew 28, that we're to go and make disciples, teaching them to observe all that I command you. Uh, it, we could also pull in uh, Matthew 22, where Jesus is approached, which is the greatest commandment? And he answers the, um, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So loving God and loving people. You see how that all fits together. We are making disciples who love God and love people. That's our credo. So as we consider this, how do we make disciples? How do we make disciples? And by the quietness in the room... I will understand that we need to hear it again. They say that repetition is the mother of learning. You know, you hear it again, you hear it again, you hear it again, and you say, finally, get it. Our discipleship process is to, I'm, I'm starting to hear it, connect, grow, serve, and reach. I heard somebody say, oh, yeah, I've heard that. Can't remember the last two. Connect, grow, serve, reach. Well, I'm going to hopefully embed this in your minds week after week because that's the process by which we see just basic growth and how we make, can help make disciples. Is this the only way? No. Are these the only words you could ever use to make disciples? Absolutely not. This is a way in which for us to understand disciple making here at Calvary Crossroads. So the first one, Oh, I, I need to say this. this is from Dallas Willard. Since disciple, making disciples is the main task of the church, every church ought to be able to answer two questions. What is our plan for making disciples and is our plan working? And so here we're kind of got this framework, connect, grow, serve, reach, and then we, every once in a while, have to take a, a step back and look at it. Are we being effective in this? And that's part of what the elders are going to be doing in these next couple of days, is looking at just what's going on in the church. Are we effective? How can we grow in other ways? How can we encourage? Or what do we need to, God forbid, take away? Ooh, yeah, that's part of, part of the process. What is ineffective? So connecting, connecting is with God, first of all, salvation, that we all need to come into that relationship, but it's also connecting with each other and gaining relationships because we are forever family. We will be seeing each other's faces for eternity and we need to love one another. And so there are opportunities all throughout uh, our experience here at Calvary Crossroads to fellowship. We have the, um, the potluck on, on the first Sunday of, of uh, every month. And that's just designed to, number one, but uh, number two, to get together and talk and build relationships with one another. <clears throat> but I, I will say this, that there are other opportunities all throughout, like before and after service. Well, Jim, why don't we have a time in our service when we stop and we shake hands with each other? You've got time before and after. Use it. Don't just come in here and plop down in the seat. You know, use that. Come a half an hour early and get to know each other and drink a cup of coffee and, and, uh, and enjoy each other's company. But then there's the growing. How does this happen? Now, growing is kind of for yourself, it's that you grow. How do you grow? This is an inward thing that's happening. You're moving towards spiritual maturity. You're growing up in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, as Peter would say. And it's absolutely, absolutely, can I say that again? Absolutely imperative for our spiritual health that everyone grow. You personally and we together must grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. How does that happen? Primarily by getting in the word of God. Understanding God's message for us. 
understanding the scope, the sequence uh, of, the, of the scriptures, understanding what the writers meant, how it then applies to my life. But it's not just the understanding. It's the, oh, it's this kind of like the follow me part. It is what I plug into my life, that I'm supposed to love one another, that I am supposed to speak the truth in love to others, that I am to be hospitable, allowing the Spirit of God to work within me so that the fruit of the Spirit comes out, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, all of these things just exuding out toward one another. And that's how you know that you're growing is because you are a different person. And just as Andrew and Peter were mending their nets and, and, and working and casting their nets, they left Jesus, left it all and followed him, and they were completely forever changed, useful in the hands of Jesus. The discipleship process takes place by getting involved in Bible studies, getting involved in good, solid teaching. You're here, you're already involved in that process, but there's a lot more. The discipleship process involves contact. Contact with each other. If you are isolated from the body of Christ, if you say, oh, well, you know, I don't need to be here. Um, They don't need me. They won't miss me. That's not true. Every member of the body is important. If my hand doesn't show up to church one day, I'm not going to be operating quite the way. You're just going to see a stump waving around. We all are to be working together. And I'm going to say this, the discipleship process, for some reason in our way of thinking, we like programs, we like processes for it to happen very clearly. There's a, there's a time and a place for all that. The primary means of discipleship takes place one-on-one. It takes place me looking at you. How are you doing in the Lord? How can I pray for you? How can I encourage you? Let's get together for coffee and talk about this. It is one on one on one on one and letting that happen or allowing the Lord to work through us is going to create a network between us and strength that we cannot have if we are all separated. That was one of the things that happened with um, COVID. We, We were all apart from each other. And it was so difficult for us to grow together. The discipleship process can happen at the men's breakfast. Discipleship groups. The ladies' in-house retreat is coming. That's part of the discipleship process. The men's roundup in the fall. That's part of the discipleship process. But don't think it's events. It's you. It's me. Getting involved in each other's lives, encouraging one another, all the more as we see the day drawing near that the Lord returns, we're to be involved in this. Now, that is not to say there is not a time and a place for study of God's word, discipleship, a class. That will happen as well. And so we're looking at uh, what the Lord wants to do with those kind of ministries. Um, so, so I'm just kind of giving you an update, you know, in, in one way, because we're going off on this retreat, and I know what we're going to be talking about, and, and these are some of the things that are coming up. Um, I have to bring this one up. How many of you text? How many of you text? Okay. Hands down. My wife. Yeah, uh-oh. My wife has a very strong texting ministry. And you know where it takes place quite often? On the couch, in her bathrobe, 
and a cup of coffee. And she'll just sit there and start texting all the women she knows. And, Bro, how are you doing? You know, hey, I'm praying for you, blah, 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 all this stuff. And that's how simple discipleship can be. Because you're in somebody else's life, encouraging them without even getting out of your bathrobe. <laughs> so the last, uh, connect, grow, serve. And then we have, oh, serve. I probably ought to talk about that, serve, and that's serving one another, and that's being involved in ministry, whether it's an official ministry here at the church or whether it's just serving, picking up something that fell off uh, the table and, and you just picked up, you're serving. That's our hearts before the Lord as we start growing. Uh, and then there's reach. How do we look at the community around us? Are we just all inward focused with our attention or do, are we praying? That is one of the benefits that we have seen with the uh, GP Passion Prayer Night on Wednesday nights at 6.30. Right here it takes place. And there's a group of about 12 of us. I would like it to be uh, 150. Why? Because we need to pray. Because we have a community out there that God wants to work in and he wants to use your prayers. You don't think your prayers are uh, effective? They are. I guarantee you the enemy doesn't want you praying for the community, for each other's needs. But we have seen request after request be answered through that ministry. And I know the rest of us are praying, and that's great, and we need to keep doing that. But when we pray together, there's a strength there. And pray for what God wants to do here through Calvary Crossroads. The call of Jesus, follow me. It's not difficult to understand, but it is impacting for each one of us. He calls us to turn away from our self-interest to his interests, whatever they may be. And we know that he wants us to glorify God through our bodies, through our mind, through our strength, and he will do that. But Jim, I'm too old. But Jim, I'm too young. But Jim, I'm... Those, those are excuses. They're just excuses. God will use you where you're at. Just say, okay, Lord, I'll follow you. We have been at times deaf, resistant, disobedient, non-productive, but he wants to turn that around. He wants to work his will in you and bring you to places you've never even conceived of, to use you in ways that will impact your neighbors, your neighborhood, your family, don't be discouraged. Keep praying. Keep following the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you that you have uh, encouraged us through just such a simple phrase, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Lord, we need you to work in us. We need you to work through us. We need you, Lord, to fulfill your desires in us. May we be good disciples, directed by you, seeing the fruit of you working in us and through us. Lord, call the lost to yourself. Use us as your tools in this process. Lord, let us not be disobedient, but let us hear your voice and trust and obey. In Jesus' name, amen.